uh, committee meeting. Uh, could you please call the roll? Yes, uh, Ms. Herbert. Here. Mr. McDowell. We've got some wonderful guests today. Excited to hear about all, thing, all things arts today. What Lee Snellgrove and the, the, the Richland County Public Library System uh, are doing for uh, cultural arts. So he's going to kick it off today. And then we want to take some time to really dig in on an annual update. Well, things that our local arts agency partner at One Columbia are doing. And we look forward to reporting back to the uh, full council on all things arts. So, Lee, appreciate you being here, man. Thank you very much. Um, I realized I was, I was walking over here. I think the last time I stood at this podium, I was trying to convince you to get a new flag, and that was sure. just before a pandemic. So I haven't been in this room in a while. Um, okay, so um, I am Lee Snellgrove. I am currently the Arts and Culture Manager at Richland Library, and I uh, formerly was the Director of One Columbia for Arts and Culture. Um, and that's how you, most of you knew me. So some people are still realizing I made a change. Um, and in my role at the library, um, I, I'll kind of set this up in such a way, I think I want to tell you about, you know, where, how we, and what I've been doing at the library and how it relates to what some of Ms. Reese will talk about. Um, almost exactly a year ago that I started at the Richland Library in a new role uh, of arts and culture manager. Um, the library a lot of work in the cultural sphere, offering resources, um, connecting with partner organizations and things. They realized they wanted to do it in a more coordinated way. It's always been um, certainly a part of the uh, renovations of library spaces. Many of the library spaces devoted to creative endeavors, maker spaces, recording studios, uh, computer labs for creative cloud suite. Um, and they, they, in the renovations, they created a gallery. Um, and they had an arts librarian, um, Ashley Worthen, who uh, was handling the artists in residence program and doing things like that. But they uh, creating a more focused vision for how the library exists within the cultural community in the, in the Columbia area and what kind of uh, cultural opportunities the library can provide. Um, and the way we uh, have thought through this over the last year is that, you know, the library is, I mean, it's in the, the slogan of the library, Access Freely, and the library provides that base level access for many people in many different things. It could be information, it could be use of a computer, and it can also be a, now, a uh, drum sander or a, uh, a bandsaw. You know, it, it, could, it could be a gardening tool that they check out from the library things. So there's lots of ways that the library is providing important resources to people. And we wanted to make sure that those resources were also working for our artists, artists that want to create businesses, and even young people that might want to pursue careers in creative industries um, and have lots of ideas and they want to find a way to uh, turn those ideas into their the rest of their life. So, um, so what we've done, uh, I, I, the only thing I have to present to you today is kind of our our plan um, that we have just implemented um, in the last several months, it mirrors um, the library strategic plan and is kind of based on that. Um, but really we focused um, all the things that the library offers into several um, sort of pillars is what I called them. Um, the focus is really, like I said, um, creating access um, uh, and uh, we created these pillars, we're focused on community um, and how people engage, the customer experience, so what, what happens when they come in and how do they experience the library spaces as they are, and what can we be doing in terms of education um, to help them learn how to do that creative endeavor or turn that creative endeavor into a career. Um, so under the community, you'll see we provide space. Uh, like I've mentioned a few, um, uh, these are spaces where they can meet, spaces where they can build a, a nonprofit, they can collaborate, um, things like that. We build a lot of relationships. We work with um, all, good, all Good Books. We work with uh, the universities in lots of different capacities. We work with the new uh, Finney Center. Uh, we, all these organizations we are already partnered with um, to help feature a lot of the activities they're doing, but also sort of work within the library's mission to accomplish even bigger goals. And we do a lot um, around public engagement since many of our locations are located in neighborhoods. 
people rely on those library locations for a place to do the activities that they want to do or engage with their neighbors. Um, that could be a quilting group, which we often call So Divine. They, go, they get together, they, they make together, and that's how a lot of their social interaction in that neighborhood. And our, our locations in those neighborhoods are deeply ingrained in those neighborhoods and providing those resources specifically <laughs> to what those neighborhoods need. Um, and then customer experience, so we have a, a huge number of events. Um, our team reviews uh, the proposals from all our staff, plus we add on, there's at least 1,200 events a year at the Richland Library across our 13 locations. Um, and many of those are arts, crafts, hobbies, um, author talks, writing workshops, those are the, the primary thing. Also there's story times, that takes up a big chunk. Those happen every week multiple times a week at different locations. So people are engaging in the arts in lots of ways. Um, we have exhibits, we have the exhibit space, the main gallery. Um, we also have an art collection that we're working to feature more. We want people to be able to walk into the building and have an arts experience, whether they intend to or not, they will engage in some kind of um, creative happening. Like if, even if it just means they're walking in the entrance and they're passing by, uh, the mural that is being put on the new uh, student building, the standard right next door, or they're coming in and they're seeing a part of our art collection, or they're seeing an exhibit, or they're meeting with our artists and residents. There's there's a way that they're going to have that even in, in a passive way. Um, and then education. So uh, we we our staff already create a lot of programs that are specifically designed to work with people about art creation or cultural creation. Um, we we want to provide a lot more information. So if a young person goes in and uses our North Main recording studio, that they'll be able to take the next step after they've done that initial project. So if they if they create a a recording of some beats that they have come up with, then where do they go next? And we want to be able to provide that to them and share that. You know, they, okay, next thing might cost you money because we're about access. <laughs> But here's where you can go, and here's who you can talk to. You can talk to this artist, or you can go to this recording studio, and they will help you take it to the next level where you want to go. And then career development. Obviously, we have our business and careers department. They help a lot of people with interviews, resumes, things like that, even getting business licenses and talking about how business uh, entrepreneurship opportunities. They have an entrepreneur in residence program. And I see definitely connection there to many of the artists that are living and working in our community. They are business owners in most cases. They have created a business for themselves, whether it's to sell their art or teach their workshops or uh, create their public art. They, they are businesses and we wanna provide that support too so that they can have a career here. Um, so um, on the next page, which maybe you can click it. There, there we go. Um, so just uh, the last thing, just to kind of point out and set, set things up for the next phase like uh, of this discussion is, Alignment. Um, obviously, I was involved in the in the work around Amplify, and and I think it's informed both where the library is going as a whole, and it, it kind of informs a lot of arts organizations. Um, it is a good roadmap. It had a lot of public input, and it really kind of um, directs how people want to engage in culture in our community, and it showed us a lot of opportunities. Um, working with neighborhoods was a big priority, and that is where the library is well suited, is to work with them. Uh, so the things we're doing, we're, you know, we're, we're, I mentioned a few, but we're also seeking very large grants. We're going to need partners on those. Um, we're going to need partners like One Columbia. We're going to need partners like the City of Columbia to showcase the, the opportunity that is here and why people should invest in Columbia and why um, we have a talented pool of people that we can work with to create opportunities for young people and older folks alike that want to um, be a part of our city's culture. Um, so you'll see the alignment, you'll see um, kind of the things we're doing um, and um, that, that's, that's where the library's at right now. Fantastic. Love it. Fantastic. Do you have any questions? No, but I wrote down an assignment to go check out the recording studio at the North Main Library. They've had a recording studio for a long time since it was renovated. However, it was just one tiny room, and they've been able to expand it to where it has now the live side where the recording happens and the, the processing side or the production side where you know somebody can sit at a board and tweak the, tweak the sounds and, and make sure that the recording's good when it comes out of there. Um, I think they're still finding their footing on you know, getting people in there because it wasn't finished until just a couple months ago. 
Um, and certainly the, the library has been under a lot of um, staffing pressures like everywhere these days, but um, so they, they might not have it like fully operation as to what we all hope, but they're getting there and they're working really hard. Um, we also have an oral history room um, and we were able to record an interview yesterday with IS Levy Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, hoping, I mean, part of the intent of that at Edgewood was to collect those stories of community members and really um, hold on to that history before it, it becomes lost mm -hmm. um, to time. And certainly with um, the passing of many of our greats lately, it's put an emphasis on why we need to get mm -hmm. more people in there talking about what they've been able to do for Columbia and how they are a big part of what the culture of Columbia is right now. And we're actually working on a project. Um, we're hoping with uh, One Columbia on that um, to, to do a lot of interviews around uh, a certain population of the city so we can tell their story. Fantastic. So let me, I want to ask you about the art, artisan residency program. Yeah. Um, how long, I mean, so, so you provide space um, that allows artists to to do the wonderful work that they do. Is there a time frame? That, yeah, we, that they we have? hire two artists. Now we're doing it, we're, we've got a call out right now um, to collect applications. So they apply, they give us their information, their portfolio, and the kind of programming they would like to do. Mm -hmm. um, we are hiring for a full year. So we have two per year, and they're in that studio space about six months, not concurrently. So one How at a time. How much studio space do you have over there? Uh, just one studio. Mm -hmm. um, Size wise, I guess it's about. Two to three hundred square feet, yeah. maybe in that room. It's not a huge room, but they get to avail of all the other resources mm -hmm. too. So if they need bigger meeting room or they need performance space, we can do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's been running since the library kind of renovations finished, probably about 2018. Um, I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head. We've had, but um, they are they provided that studio space for that six months. Um, they are afforded in most cases some sort of um, exhibit or performance of their work because we've had different types. Um, some are dance, some are uh, songwriting, some have been visual artists, so we can we can provide an exhibit space too. Um, and then they are they do programming, and then we try and encourage them to work with all sort of the three stratas of uh, folks that we have come to the library. So that could be adults, uh, teens, and and younger people. Um, and they create they do that programming that can take lots of different forms. It could be a dance workshop, or it could be a painting workshop, or it could be um, the most recent one we have right now, Dogan Kriga. Uh, they offered support for Photoshop because their work is a lot of collage and image. Um, and so they did a whole this past weekend did a whole sort of like virtual help desk where people could call in with their Photoshop questions and get them answered. And that's those are the artists that are that are giving back, the expectations to give back. Yes, yeah. And then they are paid for their residency. They are not just provided the space. So okay. they receive a stipend of $1,000 a month while they're there. And then, you know, they're in the studio. I think we ask them to be in the studio about 10 hours a week, right. uh, around the studio, in the studio, so that they're there and can meet with some of our uh the public that come in. Fantastic. So the, the residency program, did, did you put that in place a year ago when you came yeah, on board? It, it was already in place. It was part of the design of the renovations of the library to have it. Mm -hmm. um, the only changes we've made, I think, since I've been there are that we are now seeking them two at a time so that we can get the full year planned and ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And then I think we're specifically doing some uh, uh, engaging in certain communities that we have not previously had mm -hmm. artists and residents in. That is mm -hmm. different types of art form that we haven't had yet or certain uh, minority communities that haven't been represented. So would you be open to looking for locations to partner with using the Richland County Library programming, let's say if, whether it's Parks and Rec of the city or Richland County Parks and Rec? To really get into the neighborhoods, like your yeah, like so your goal is one of the grant applications that I'm I'm interested that we are going to be seeking is for some um, I wouldn't call them artists and residents because they're a little bit different, but really mm -hmm. community artists that will work on the library's behalf to work in neighborhoods and build relationships with mm -hmm. communities around our locations. And, and describe that grant for us. What, uh, what, so it would be with, a, a national what, endowment for the arts grant, and we are crafting it now for a, a submission in July, and we wouldn't be able to see anything happen for another year because NEA's grant timeline is extensive. It takes a long time to get those. Um, but we hope that it would, it would afford us some opportunity for artists to work directly with communities to create. could be music, could be visual arts, in a neighborhood to really help the library deepen its relationship with those individual communities around locations. Um, it'd have to be very um, 
we, we hope that it would build up into something even bigger. But in this initial phase, it would be pretty limited to about just four or five artists that we would be able to support um, through a program like that. And just so just so I'm clear, um, the Richardson County Library and and your 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 operation is separate than Richland County. So Richland yeah. County doesn't necessarily have any um, relationship with One Columbia as as you do at the library. Yeah, I mean we are we are a I mean you know county millage organization, right? But we are not necessarily tied with the governance of the gotcha. county. Is, uh, the board of trustees at the library is appointed by the county. Okay, fantastic. And do you have a formal? Uh, Kind of operating agreement partnership with One Columbia. Yes, I think we've we've had uh, letters of support for different projects we've shared because it's mostly project oriented, um, but they are definitely one of our regular partners that we work with on lots of different things okay. and communicate with. Fantastic. Well, listen, we'd love to talk to you more about expanding out to the communities through Parks and Rec and our wonderful facilities throughout the city, uh, Miss Herbert. Mm -hmm. I just have a somewhat random um, question, but um, piano lessons. Yeah. Um, and you were talking about the artist in residency. Is that a situation where if you had a musician who came in that their give back could be piano lessons to kids? It's possible. It's hard to do that because that is such a one-on-one -on -one type of program, you know, of, of especially giving specific piano lessons. Right. Um, but we have had musicians that have done songwriting workshops or it, maybe not so much focused on the learning of the instrument because often that there are other avenues for that. There's school time for the orchestra and the band. Um, but there, and yes, piano lessons are often a, a pretty difficult thing. I think to find you end up finding somebody in your neighborhood, you hope that knows how to do it and teach because getting a piano is really hard these days. Um, um, but it could be something that if that, if that artist in residence proposed to us and wanted to do, I think we'd find a way to do it, but um, in that individual case of uh, like a piano teacher, it'd be tough, I think, for them to do that one-on-one. -on -one. They, they'd have a very full schedule. <laughs> but, um, you know, the musicians that we've had in the past have always found other ways that they can um, sort of teach their art form and pass that along to community members that are interested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks so much. We, we look forward to uh, seeing the wonderful, great things you continue to do at the library. Miss Marjorie. Hello. Marjorie Reese, Interim Executive Director, One Columbia for Arts and Culture. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thanks for having us. I'm looking forward to this conversation and um, I have some prepared notes, but please feel free to ask other thoughts Absolutely. as they come ahead. Um, we just want to give you some updates on what's happened at One Columbia during this interim period. Um, we've The organization's board asked me to be the interim executive director with a couple of priorities. One was to reconstitute the staff. Um, thanks to a grant from the Knight Foundation, um, we were able to add a couple of uh, contract positions. One that follows what Lee was saying to you and the Amplifies commitment to community involvement. We were able to hire a community engagement specialist. Some of you know Darian McLeod, that's a theater artist in town. Um, and he offices at our office on, on Duke Avenue. I'll tell you more about that in a second. Um, and his job is to animate that space and to work in neighborhoods to make sure that artists have opportunities for visibility and that the public has access to uh, the resources. Um, we hired... Um, Public Art Administrator, Pamela uh, Zeljak. We recruited, took us a few months. Uh, we recruited um, regionally and Pamela relocated here from Florida to take uh, on this position and her background is in public art as a public art administrator. And then shortly after I arrived um, and during the search for an executive director, our office manager was stolen from us by the Arts Commission, which we were very excited about for her. And so in the midst of our talking with the mayor and thinking about what role One Columbia could strengthen, one of them was public information. So we were able to hire recently Rachel Flood, um, who is both our office manager, but has a marketing background and will be doing more of our social media, et cetera. And because we've um, we received a grant from the 
Central Carolina Community Foundation to do more programming for young people. We created a technical theater training program that will launch this summer. And um, to help us organize that, we hired um, a young man who is a student at USC, but is a technical theater specialist. And so with his background and skills, we've been able to recruit um, teaching artists that will facilitate this program. And it will launch uh, this summer in a number of theater venues around the county, actually. And I have a question. Is, is that just a title technical or is it bringing more technology into mm -hmm. the... Thank you. So a lot of the research that we've done over time has shown that especially for young people of color, entering the field of technical theater, so lighting, stage design, sound design, costume design, my own background is costume design, so I'm always looking for. So this is a training program to help young people see careers um, and jobs um, in the in. Back, the backstage fields of, of the performing and visual arts. Uh, Ms. Reese, let me ask you something uh -huh. real quick. The community engagement specialist, if we could dive into that for a second yeah. real quick. So what, what, what kind of interaction does that individual have as far as getting into the communities? Is there interfacing with City of Columbia? Just, just give us a description of, of that. Sure. It's mostly with the neighborhood-based, nonprofit, some non-arts organizations churches, um, community associations, nonprofit groups that work with um, young women, for example. But connecting with those organizations and helping them utilize the arts and artists in their mission. Um, we use the facility at Duke Street. We allow nonprofit groups to use that building on Saturdays to do art classes for kids, um, et cetera. So it's, that, it's breaking down the barrier, the idea that the arts are for somebody else in some other place, um, and going into schools heavily, into neighborhood associations, et cetera, to you know, encourage participation and find out what people need. Okay. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The search for the permanent executive director seems to be never ending, but it is ongoing. Uh, we've done three calls now, one locally, one regionally, and now we're on our second going back to the regional uh, call. The, the, most of the hiccup has been inviting someone to relocate with a salary that we're able to offer um, and or um, looking for someone with prior arts administration experience so that they're not starting from, from zero. But we've, as recently as last week, interviewed a candidate that we thought was going to meet the board's expectations. We were... We were asked to go back, and now we have one other one um, that's in the hopper. So that search will continue, and hopefully you won't have to see me much more. But um, it's a very important step for the organization to take, to elevate the salary and then to make sure that the person has the skills to implement the amplified plan. Um, back in October, the board um, had its annual retreat and um, establish a couple of priorities for the organization. One is the marketing and visibility to promote Columbia-based artists and arts organizations, um, to promote the cultural and entertainment aspects of the city's resources to tourism, to tourists, to focus on providing space. So I appreciate your question about artist residency space. We met with a group of, of artists, um, I don't know, about a month ago now, and space for Residency spaces, studio spaces still rises to the top of what they need. So um, in, in, in a more recent venture in that direction, we partnered with Stormwater Studios recently. They had an opening, which don't come up very often, uh, for a resident artist. And so we did a workshop for local artists. Primarily, they were focused, Stormwater's focus was on, um, you know, engaging its first artist of color ever. And so we did a workshop with a number of African-American artists, helped them through the process, talked to them about submitting, et cetera. And so the artist was selected and um, will begin that residency for a year because that, that residency requires a um, uh, payment to be a resident. You have to provide, you have to pay. 
um, Stormwater Studios was not able to fully fund that. So One Columbia did fund that in, in line with our next priority, which is to increase support for artists to allow them to be able to take advantage of those kinds of opportunities. A couple of other priorities quickly. Um, find new ways for artists to be visible in neighborhoods, which is what the community engagement specialist is doing. Um, more art classes for children. So our relocating to the Duke Street Avenue space is a move in that direction so that we are based in a neighborhood now and much more visible. Um, developing partnerships to elevate the role of the arts in Columbia. I'm happy to say, and Pamela will takes all the credit for this, we've been partnering and having a conversation with the State Arts Commission. And in June, uh, we'll host the first public art dialogue in Columbia, inviting public art artists, visual artists, emerging visual artists um, to come to Columbia and meet with specialists who've worked across the country, um, panel members from three or four different states. We'll talk about how to get into the competition to win a commission for public art, not just only, not just locally, but public art competitions nationally. So how do we strengthen partnerships that'll give our artists more of an opportunity to be seen um, and be prepared? And then broadening our financial base of support, um, which is always important. You'll see uh, some of the work that we've been doing, the Central Carolina Community Foundation, the Arts Commission, we have two, three grants in play now from the Arts Commission, um, applying to the NEA and then um, funding from the Knight Foundation, which is largely funding our public art work and some community engagement work. We moved in February. I'm happy to say um, the downtown space just frankly became uninhabitable. Um, it was just not well maintained by the landlord. So the board decided that we should move to a space that we already were paying rent for, um, this house on Duke Avenue. I would welcome you guys to come. Um, so the downstairs floor is used by local artists and arts organizations, and our offices are upstairs. Um, this past year, we've done a lot of work picking up from our previous executive director's legacy working in the area of public art, but focusing on uh, condition reports. What's the shape of each piece that's in the city? What's the condition of it? Is it has it been damaged? Does it need repair? What kind of repair, et cetera. Um, drafting protocols, um, which is something we wanna bring back to you uh, today also, but drafting some protocols, doing research on cities our size, cities with the same kind of mayor council structure, city manager structure, um, so that this committee will have uh, an opportunity to think about what do you want in your public art policy? And then also focusing on cataloging or finishing that work so that the public can, from our website, um, see the public art collection, um, create their own um, walking tour, but we're also creating those. There are a couple of private development projects that are currently underway, Benton Crossing, a standard that Lee talks about, and then just beginning to work with the Park Department on um, public art projects for Finley Park. Where is that Where is that conversation, Mr. Simons, um, with One Columbia for Finley Park? So you know, we've, we've been had, having some extensive discussion about art in the park as we've been planning for Finley Park. So along the way, um, we've been been doing that with One Columbia to create a program so we can rotate art in the parks. So we've, we've had some extensive dialogue okay. about that, yeah. And then I had a question too, because I think I got the email about Benton Crossing. How did you all negotiate that? Um, how did that come about? Or them agreeing to do it? So that, so that was negotiated when I was still director. Let me just find the microphone yeah, yeah, yeah. so they can hear me on the, the web. Um, uh, so I was, I negotiated that when I was, um, director. The way that came about is that I guess in the review of the architectural plans for that site, um, it was determined that, you know, one way they could, 
uh, fall within the bounds of the zoning requirements and, and other um, review, you know, design requirements, uh, that they could add public art on that bottom level. That's happened in a few cases with private developers. And uh, the city offers for us, uh, you know, at the time, when me at One Columbia and now with Pamela to go in and, and talk with them about what opportunities they can take advantage of. Uh, One Columbia then would uh, sort of enter a, a, an agreement with them. Uh, and so in that case, we entered an agreement with the folks doing Benton Crossing, set a sort of estimated budget for their kind of project and talked about the parameters. Um, since that construction has just started, everything's been handed over to Pamela, and Pamela is now in communication with lots of the communities um, that are around that, so that they're a big part of how that art is identified uh, with that private developer. Um, I think that's where One Columbia really offers uh, a difference in that process by really engaging community members um, so that they are a part of selecting that art, and it really represents the community. Um, and developers appreciate that, especially mm -hmm. when they are not already located here in Columbia. Did that, was that through a tax, a, a property tax incentive? No, um, there is no such thing available to us. It, they just um, are encouraged to do it to meet the zoning requirements or the design requirements um, that the city has uh, around blank facades. Um, so if they are, especially often what happens when it's like first level parking, um, a lot of times that comes windowless and needs something. So instead of doing what we've seen in years past, like with the Meridian building of having like fake storefronts that are like glassed, uh, a lot of times now they'll encourage them to do murals or public art as part of it. Uh, because it, like we're, over time, it requires a lot less maintenance. So it's good faith better. by the developer. Yes. So what, it's, can you put a price tag on that good faith investment? Uh, that in that making? case, specifically with Brenton Crossing, I think the budget is uh, 19,000 for the whole project. Uh, with the standard that we mentioned, which followed a similar pathway, uh, that whole project, uh, only half of that was through the design requirements. Another half was in a partnership easement with the Richland Library. But that total project um, on both sides of the building is 30000 Fantastic. Thanks, Lee. And then one other question um, that I just almost forgot. Um, to have the the neighborhood, so the community engagement, is this something that they have asked for or is this something that they will learn about? Like the community itself? Yes. It's typical um, when you're working on projects inside of neighborhoods that the conversation should begin with the resident community. So organizing those conversations, seeking out the um, key people in the community that would be spokespeople or that would create some sort of a, an advisory committee. And so that's the step where Pamela is now. So I guess my question maybe is a step back because some folks, not everyone loves murals. We're, Correct. Um, and so that's, I was trying to get more clarity. Do they know that one is coming at all? Well, and, and it hasn't been decided that the project would be a mural in this case. And so that's the uh, input that this kind of process- So it could works. be something different. It could be something different. Such as? be a piece of sculpture. It could be a rotating uh, mini art you. park. Okay. Statue of you. And you know, some, uh, <laughs> some cities actually have an ordinance that allows public art not to be uh, tangible, not to be fixed. The public art could be piano classes. Um, Target stores in, when I worked in another city, um, wanted to in, be engaged with the public. And so they sponsored something called, it's a music education program that's now 20 something years old. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a music education program. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on what the community is asking for, what the ordinance allows, and what the budget is. Fantastic, and, and Lee was very mindful for that neighborhood outreach. So. Mm -hmm. Here's to hoping you continue that. Oh, it's a priority. It's definitely a priority. I just want to point out, I talked about the um, conservation, just so you can see the work that's, we're documenting the damage to public artworks around the city and then beginning a program to address the decline. And then with respect to the budget, the 19000 that is coming out of your budget, or is it coming out of the developer's budget? The developer's budget. I think the artist fee, though, is fifteen. That comes out of that comes out of the nineteen. The artist fee for the project is nineteen, and then we capture some administrative costs out of the remainder. Okay. 
Um, again, just a couple of the community engagement initiatives that we've launched this year, uh, the stormwater residency, um, artist development workshops. Um, we convened a couple of months ago, all of the technical theater directors in the city as we were crafting this technical theater training program for kids to talk with them about what their facilities needed, how they might be involved and how young people might eventually be on their staff. Um, we do public art tours. Um, we're collaborating with the uh, South Carolina Arts Commission more now that we have the local arts agency designation. Um, and one will be this public art dialogue that I mentioned a minute ago. The technical theater training, some student internships. We have had interns in the past from USC. Um, this year we're adding to and have been in dialogue with Allen University to bring some of their students over, mostly journalism students, um, over uh, for the summer. Uh, the Princess Empowerment Residency is one of those community organizations that we mentioned earlier. They're a nonprofit, they're not affiliated with us, but they needed a place to meet in a neighborhood. And so that's one of the ways that we're re responding to that need. And then offering workshops, providing meeting spaces for local arts organizations. Um, this is a little bit of our funding uh, picture. We're trying to branch out, as you see, um, to get additional dollars to do some of this community engagement work uh, that you hear. Um, Target Stores is providing supplies for the Czech theater training students this summer. Um, South Arts is an organization, our regional arts organization. We have applied for some professional development funding to provide funding for the workshops for artists. Um, Central Carolina, I've mentioned uh, the State Arts Commission, the Knight Foundation, and today is Midlands Gives Day. And I'm happy to report that we met our goal about an hour or so ago. Can you can you just give us a general ballpark figure of, of what these revenue streams, what level they're at? And, and also speak to, you know, I wanna circle grants. I, I feel like what, what are we, what grants are we not able to pursue or just don't have the, the capacity to pursue because we don't, possibly don't have the strength in grant writing? Um, are we leaving money out there that we, we could be going We need the city or we want to be Well, oh, you're our local arts agent, okay. right? I just want to make sure I was answering the right question. Yeah, this, this, this mm -hmm. partnership we got going. Yeah. We do have uh, a lot more capacity now that we have the designation. Uh, so that designation allows us to receive uh, a $40,000 grant from the State Arts Commission, but we were not able to apply for it in the past. And that's just year one. Um, we also have an outstanding request to them to fund more arts education programs in the city. Um, so the grant writing um, capacity right now, um, I bring a lot of that myself, but we will need to train somebody and make sure that we have someone that can keep that up. Our grant to the Knight Foundation is also pretty pretty hefty lift mm -hmm. for the organization, $150,000 over the time period. Um, is really important. And that, by the way, is an, an example of money left on the table. If we got more involvement with the city from the city in that process, there is additional dollars for collaboration. What does that look like? What does more involvement from the city look like for that process? It looks like um, uh, an intentional partnership with, say, Parks and Rec. Um, we do partner with Parks and Rec now, but the grant would come from the needs of, the, of that department. We would put the arts uh, components inside of it, but it, rather than it being... Um, just a, um, we, we need more of, when I say intentional, we would want to sit down with the parks department and say, we have 10 facilities. This is for example. We'd like to have 10 artist residencies uh, in these facilities or three exhibitions. Um, and, and so our organization would say, oh great, we'll prepare the artists. Here's what that would look like. We'll make sure they are trained, that the scope of the residency meets what the needs of the community would be. Our team would meet with community so it would be a real um, braided partnership as opposed to one that we just do because it's, it's a natural conversation. And so the application would come from the city of One Columbia and 
one Columbia for Arts and Culture. And that application would go to whatever grant makers are out there. Yeah, in this case, the Knight Foundation. So, so the, the format is come up, team up, come up with a wonderful program, bundle it up, and then go pursue funding from various grants. I, I think that's a, a good summary. And there are some others out there. Bloomberg is one that would really require the city's uh, heft yeah. uh, to, be, to be successful. But there are other um, foundations. Uh, the Mellon Foundation, for mm -hmm. example, is doing work in small and rural communities. This isn't rural, but small communities, mm -hmm. communities um, our size. The, um, the Ford Foundation believes in artist development, so going to mm -hmm. them through the city's resources. Right. So sometimes the city is the anchor um, applicant because of the city's infrastructure, the confidence in the funder, you know, those kinds of things. So, so for the, I'll just take Lee's program of the artists in residency and the, and the workshops. Mm -hmm. There's, we have a template there. So it sounds like putting together the, the, the programming and yeah. to a certain extent the application, what are we missing? Are we missing a, 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 a grant writer to come in with a strong, um, uh, believable, fundable grant application to go to various grant writers or grant makers throughout the country? Um, I don't think we're missing anything, quite honestly. I think we're missing will. The, the, the stated will to collaborate and do such kinds of things. Uh, the template, and I agree that the library template is fabulous, the template we created during the Amplify plan. Mm -hmm. We trained artists to become teaching artists. We wrote a curriculum. We engaged, I can't remember how many were in our core. Um, and so the templates are out there. I mean, that's a it's a fairly common uh, way to work. I think it is more of a determination that we would sit down together and say, okay, Margie, what we really want, what we really want is um, more connecting back to Amplify, more spaces where artists can have a job. Give me some ideas. So we would, would make several recommendations to you. And then the council or my board would say, go find the funding. And that's what we had to do with the... Um, Arts the launching the kids program this summer is go find the money. We put the program together and shopped it around to two or three foundations, Central Carolina. Well, are you Florida. limited to the go find the, the money portion because of f funding from whatever sources on Columbia gets? I guess my question is if you had if, if you had more funds dedicated to grant writing, specifically grant writing, could you go find more funds for programs specifically like we're talking yeah. about? Sure. That's always a good yes to have more grant writing support. Well, and I'm what I think I'm hearing though is you want more you would need more direction from the city oh, yeah. on what our overall goals are. That think that's it. Um as a nonprofit organization, we can raise funds for the programs that we based on the board's goals design and implement. As your local arts agency, um, we would work with the city's team, identify the city's needs in the area of arts programming, arts education, arts in neighborhoods, et cetera. Now, that, then, wait, that point right there, identifying the city's needs, is that something that the city would be expected to do, or is that what you all could do based on what you've seen other cities do? Both. Because I kind of think sometimes, you know, people have to tell us yeah. what we need yeah. or both. give us ideas. Um, so that Because mm -hmm. if you're not an arts person, it's just kind of hard. Um, yeah, and I think that we learned a lot during the Amplify planning process when we met with Parks, et cetera. The next step is a sit down with whatever group you would designate and say, okay, now, local arts agency partner, what's possible? What can we do? And then the city would decide what its first three priorities are. We would be the collaborating entity to design, to implement, to fundraise for those programs. This is our first year as a local arts agency. So we're all of us are kind of learning um, who's on first. But most cities, um, staff people, work with the local arts agency if they're a nonprofit, if they're in-house 
Um, it's a city staff driven. But in this case, it would be so helpful so that we're not coming to you after the fact saying, here's what we think. We're collaborating on the design. We're collaborating on setting the goals and setting the measures and the metrics. Some of it connects back to um, the city's comprehensive plan, by the way. So putting artists in, um, I, I wanted, wanted to say earlier, I took piano lessons in the fire station when I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are ways to incorporate the arts into just about every city department. But we need the imprimatur, we need the go forth message from a planning meeting, you know, a sit down and sort of collaborating out conversation. Did you hear that there was a, somebody wanted piano lessons? I kind of heard that in the back of my mind. I also took tap dancing lessons there too. Um, but it's just, again, to say that the city has resources already on the table that can be capitalized with this kind of collaborating dialogue. A couple of items. Uh, back to the localized agency discussion, uh, we have a one-year um, agreement with the city. That year will end in June, and we would like to know from this committee, how do we come back to you and ask for an extension of that designation? Um, what would you like to see? Um, our general services contract, we, we really need to have an, another, again, it's a sit-down conversation. We, we come back, One Columbia um, presents a... Uh, uh, a roster of activities, a budget, a request every year. That's appropriate. But I think it would be more, I, Margie, think it would be more helpful if we were to have a conversation with the city about how do we expand the services that are in our contract now. Right now we're focusing on tourism, marketing, we do that. But our contract does not include some of the things we're talking about, community engagement, for example. So we, we do find alternate fundraising to do the neighborhood-based stuff, most of our emphasis is on um, attracting tourism, which is a big and very important um, um, task. I also want to talk to you guys today or at some other point about reanimating the exhibition space that's in this building on the first floor. Um, One Columbia used to be a part of programming that space. Um, everything is about funding. But right now it's about space to showcase local artists. And if we were able to, to learn who in city government we would create that partnership with or we engage in that, we would be able to respond to artists who are looking for spaces to show their work and then to promote that to the public. Um, and then the Amplify Cultural Plan, just to say that that is the roadmap, as Lee says, that we're continuing to follow and want to know from you, how do we engage with this committee in a more structured way um, to make sure that we are focusing on the components of the plan um, that this committee and the city council would like to see. Um, these are just a couple of examples of how other city halls are using their gallery spaces. Um, and then our social media posts, which helps us to keep up with the public. So that's my story. I do want to come back to the conversation about a public art policy and ordinances or however this committee would like us to uh, support that quest. Uh, Pamela has done some research um, and I'll be glad to leave these examples with the city clerk um, of other cities our size and structure that might be templates for launching that. But to develop a public art policy is, as you can imagine, is more than just picking one off the shelf, right? It has to connect with the comprehensive plan, with the public's idea, what they want, um, with um, ordinances, you know, it's a shop kind of conversation, but I do think it's one that the Amplify plan for sure called for and one that I really appreciate this committee. My question for this body is how do we have a sit down, thoughtful conversation about what this committee wants, expertise can bring to the table? Um, how do we begin to draft such a thing? Well, let me ask you this. Is it 
right? Right. So uh, I think, uh, what's the timeline? I'm sorry, you said earlier, hopefully in the next 60, 90 days, you'll have a new executive director. So, yes. <laughs> yeah. So experience there might help our conversation move along. And, yeah. and also digging back into the Amplify mm -hmm. study um, and everything that came out of that um, to, to, I guess, take a look at the overarching approach. Um, we, we will start meeting more often. Okay. of this committee, and we need to continue to have these conversations um, mm -hmm. as we move forward. One last question before I turn it over to Tina for any questions she has. One Columbia as a local arts agency, you are essentially a resource to all artists, all nonprofits, all artist groups. Can you give us an example since you've been a local, the, the local arts agency designation? Have any other smaller arts groups reached out to you as a resource to team up to go after grants, you know, any anything to, to speak of in that capacity? The answer is yes, and even before we got the designation, but in more recent months. Mm -hmm. um, artists are restricted to applying for some grants as individual artists. Mm -hmm. And so one Columbia can serve as a fiscal agent, as the actual applicant, okay. and then actually as a coach to helping them craft their artist statement, to craft the project goals and missions. So we do that kind of work more one-on-one -on -one yeah. in the workshop we did at Stormwater a couple mm -hmm. of months ago. And so we're, we're meeting now with a group of artists um, who are just needing somebody to help them find a space to exhibit. Mm -hmm. And so we engage with them, we talk with them. I mean, the team does all that kind of work. So the answer is yes. That's good. And that's that's what we want to hear more of is mm -hmm. how, how you are being being a successful resource to, yeah, to growing our arts and all the talent that we mm -hmm. have here in Columbia in the Midlands. In, including the upcoming um, um, public art dialogue that Pamela is organizing. Um, we have artists in this town that are not comfortable applying for a public art commission. So this workshop will help them understand the logistics of that, the priorities for information, how to take a good photograph, how to redesign your website, how to budget, you know. Um, so those kinds of things do happen, and I appreciate having this chance to, to share that with you. Perfect. Thank you. Tina, do you have anything else? Um, the only thing I was going to say is I'm, I'm actually glad to, not glad, but that was good information to know that sometimes the artists themselves are not able to apply, and I'm assuming that's because they trust the art agency to make sure that everything is handled properly with the like with the grant funds. I think there not are that they some... can't trust the artists exactly, but just to in, is it more of an accountability? Actually, it's both. It it is accountability, but it's um it's legislated based. Mo more government agencies. Um, the state tax code doesn't allow them to grant to an individual. They need the backup of a structure of a board or 501c3 status. And so that's why many local arts agencies serve as a fiscal receiver um, for, for public funding in particular. Now, foundations are a little different, a lot more flexible. They will award individuals. But again, artists don't know where to go look for those dollars or even how to present themselves. And so that's a function that we continue to, um, to provide. Fantastic. Well, I will say we are excited about Finley Park. It's, it's coming along. Um, Henry, if you could keep the dialogue going and let us know the, from, from just hearing about the, the, the sculptures, the art presentation that will be involved in Finley Park, I think it's very exciting. Um, and I think there's some wonderful um, energy that could happen. So. And I encourage you guys to, this committee to use us as a resource. I know we're a structured partner and I'm interim, but I got a, you know, a lot of miles on this old body and I can provide input. Well, getting community arts programs going, I think, is something we're very yeah. interested in. So that's very a dialogue good. we'd like to have. But then on the flip side, going out and finding grants to make it happen is also important to us. So. Absolutely. Great. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lee Margie um, and the team. Um, if there's no other comments, questions, we will adjourn. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.